Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. On today's program, here in the latter part of April of 2015, I have a guest on that I've had on before, about two years ago. He is Jorge Lopez, and he's a professor of physics at UT El Paso. When I had him on the program two years ago, our main focus was discussing elections in Mexico, political corruption, and political reform. And we're going to uh, pick up on that conversation today and see what has happened in the last two years and if some of the reforms are still ongoing or if they've been sidetracked. One side note, some of my students at Community College, I let them watch some of these DVDs of some of these programs. This gentleman today that I have on, his DVD is on YouTube, Perspectives El Paso. So if you'd like to see the first program we did with Jorge Lopez, Dr. Lopez, you can do that. So you can kind of see where we were then and you can today see where we are. This morning, this very morning, one of my students brought into the class a review of the one that he picked off YouTube was with this professor. And he wrote a full page and explained, and he told me verbally, I found this program very interesting and informative. Those were words. Dr. Lopez, good to have you back. I'm really getting glad to be back. You are Thank interesting you. and informative. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't know how I feel, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm always interested on, on what is happening around me, that's, that's for sure. Okay. Now, in the interview we did a couple of years ago, you told us some of your background. You don't have to get into all of that now, but I'm sure that the audience, if they did not see that one, would like to know a little bit about how you got interested in politics and writing about politics. When you were here before, you had written two books and brought them and showed us, and then you mentioned you were working on a third book. So I think the audience would like to know what are these books about and why did you get into writing them about political corruption elections in Mexico? Let's do that first and then we'll talk about what's happened in the last two years. Sure. Um, there was uh, this uh, physicist, I. I don't remember exactly his name, one of the big names from the 1800s that uh, said, uh, if I cannot measure it, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So the idea is um, uh, in social sciences, uh, you observe, you reason, and you write about it, but um, rarely you develop um, minute detail models that explain how things happen. Okay. Well, it turns out that um, in politics, the easy way to get into that, this type of uh, analysis is through uh, looking at the numbers, looking at elections. And when you do that, there is a new world that comes alive. And uh, you can do many things with the numbers. You can get correlations, you can get uh, uh, interpolations, you can get uh, uh, all sorts of uh, things that we usually use for understanding, say, the changes of temperature in the ocean we can apply that to the data that is being provided to us by the politicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the same token, you can detect uh, irregularities, uh, abnormalities. And uh, with that, uh, all of a sudden, uh, a new field was created, uh, especially in Mexico, because Mexico began putting partial results of the elections on the screen, on the on internet. The and internet's changed everything, hasn't exactly, it? Exactly, exactly. Uh, somebody sitting in London uh, all of a sudden saw something that he couldn't believe that it was real and he began uh, studying it. He sent me the results mm -hmm. and it was it's part of uh, one of the books. Uh, with respect to the books, uh, the first two are uh, studies uh, of the 2006 election and the 2012 election. Um, and the third book, that it was a compendium of uh, works done by many people and it, it, it includes all the, the time before the election, during the election, and after the election. Mm -hmm. All of that uh, information. And uh, all of these three books can be found in Amazon. Just look under my name, Jorge Lopez. Okay. Uh, you have a telephone number, a UTEP telephone number. Do you want to yes. give that to us? Sure, scroll yes. It there? It's uh, area 915-747-7528. Yeah, because somebody may want to call you and talk to you personally, and perhaps see how they can get these and, uh, and read them. Give us the title of your most recent book. Oh, it is, it is called um, Analysis of the 
mathematical analysis of the uh, 2012 election. Now you told us before, and it uh, seems obvious, that you love dealing with statistics. You're a numbers person. Mm -hmm. But you don't just want to memorize numbers, you're looking for correlations and you're analyzing numbers. Now what about the last election in Mexico when Nieto, is that his name? He was elected yes. as president and the numbers that came out that tell you anything about that election. It, it was extremely interesting because we, we had the experience of the 2006 election and we were expecting kind of the, a repeat of the same. In other words, in 2006, it was uh, mostly done through algorithms, changing numbers in the computer, uh, not f uh, filling up the, the ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. But uh, this time, they had um, uh, t a two-throng approach they attacked the problem from two different sides. They had the computers doing their part, but at the, at the same time, they went on to the south of Mexico to little towns and they uh, spent a lot of money buying uh, voters, uh, paying off uh, people to vote, and they were, uh, all, all of this is documented. Are you talking about the PRI? The, yes, the PRI, yes, okay. the PRI. And um, it happened in, uh, at a massive scale. Now, doing the analysis from our point of view, looking at the numbers, it looks very interesting. You can actually divide the whole election into two elections, one that is pure, pristine, without any effects, and the other one that shows all the, the this uh, contaminated, corrupted data that comes from buying the, you know, some, some uh, precincts uh, had uh, 90, 100 percent people voting in the whole town, which is unheard of. You know, we on average is 30 something percent. Right, so. right. Have you had anyone that took major issue with you about presenting this and writing about this? Any public officials in Mexico are upset with you and what you're writing and saying? Well, not really. Um, there was, there has been uh, a number of uh, meetings in which um, we have participated in or, or some of my colleagues. And um, of course, there's people that does not believe the numbers, and some people uh, are on the other side. There's discussion, but nothing uh, serious, nothing from the government. As a matter of fact, um, when was it? Uh, three weeks, four weeks ago, I was invited by the Electoral Institute uh, of the State of Chihuahua to go and, um, and give training to the people that work there about detection of uh, a fraud. Mm -hmm. Now, I was told by a colleague, a colleague want me, wanted me to invite you back, and that's, that's great, and follow up on this information that we had on the previous show. And I was also told that you just recently received an honor with regard to your physics, is that right? Oh, um, yes, well, it turns out that um, with age, uh, you uh, tend to accumulate friends and, and honors, and that, that's the, the clear, a clear signal that I should be, start, uh, I should start thinking of retiring. <laughs> and and uh, I've been getting um, several awards uh, at a rate of one a year, more or less. And I, I guess the, all my friends just won me out. <laughs> well, congratulations. That Thank tells you. something about your research. You are respected for your research. Yes, I got the, the 2014 um, mentoring award mm -hmm. uh, from the American Physical, from the Division of Nuclear Physics of the American Physical Society. Uh, they pay my way to Kona in Hawaii to receive the award. I oh, like well. that very much. But uh, the one that I just got um, a week ago was uh, in uh, Baltimore, and this one is the Boucher Award. Okay. And the Boucher Award is uh, more or less for uh, lifetime achievements in, in nuclear physics, and it is especially given to minority physicists, mm -hmm. Native Americans, African Americans, or Hispanics. You want to say a word to our audience, our young audience that are now just going to college and getting their profession ahead of them there? Looking oh, at sure. Uh, the, my usual, I, I never try to pull anybody into physics, to tell you the truth, right. because uh, it's, it's, it's not for everybody. Right. But um, what I, I usually recommend is um, I find the apprenticeship m method uh, to be extremely well suited for all areas. If you can find, uh, um, if you're a young fellow, you can find an engineer and you can tag along for a week, two weeks, you're going to learn way more than studying any, any physics course or any math course. Right. You will learn if you want it, if you want to be an engineer. Or the same, you know, shadowing is a common practice for high school students uh, that are interested in medicine. Mm -hmm. So you shadow a doctor, you go here and there. Mm -hmm. And things like that, that would be the best. It, I did that with my two uh, kids, my daughter, daughter and my son and they already, she's already a PhD in material science 
and my son is getting a PhD in applied math. So now, for years we had a colleague here, Emo Michael, and he had a show here on this uh, channel with us, and he died uh, a little over a year ago. Um, he taught astronomy. Have you ever taught astronomy? Oh yes, yes. Uh, I, I was a good friend of uh, Emil Michaels. Uh, for, we had we collaborated uh, for some time. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. that's a, that. Not many people go into astronomy. No, astronomy. Uh, the difference between astronomy and physics is that it's much easier to find employment as a physicist because all, all colleges and all universities teach physics, but not all colleges and all universities teach astronomy. Mm -hmm. So it is much easier to find a job that way. But astronomy is a fascinating area because you get to confront realities uh, of something that you would never expect to see in, in, in normal day. Like for instance, the fact that the sun will stop shining at some point. <laughs> yeah. And then that, what do we do? Yes, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's not gonna be our problem, but uh, uh, you start thinking about other things. Uh, like for instance, uh, just last week, the people at the, lor at the Large Hadron Collider they they brought it back to life after some uh, a year or so mm -hmm. of uh, not working, and, and now they are ready to to check whether we there are parallel universes. Mm -hmm. Imagine mm -hmm. they are going to have a, 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 a key measurement that uh, will confirm that we live in one of the many parallels, uh, parallel universes. Okay, now let's bring it down to Earth. <laughs> a lot of people do not realize that government is involved in all of this. Government funds education mm -hmm. that trains people like you and me, yeah. and so the taxpayers are paying for a lot of this, our education. Then taxpayers have paid for colliders, and they've helped pay for the Hubble telescope. They help help pay for the rockets and all of these things that are there, and that costs money. Oh yeah, and it takes people that are willing to support those projects. Mm -hmm. Very important that government is definitely involved in this. Safety gets caught up in these issues. Yeah, too. What you're mm -hmm. doing in physics may be very dangerous to some people, mm -hmm. and so even safety issues. Now back to Mexico, back down to Earth in Mexico. In your last research over the last two years. Was there one really surprising thing that you found in your research that you weren't expecting to find? Well, um, we found interesting, um, we came up with a method to identify uh, some, um, a, a way of um, changing numbers, which is very interesting and uh, it was unexpected. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, other than that, it was kind of normal what we, we found, what we expected. Uh, it was uh, um, in some cases, like for instance, the distribution of uh, how, the, how the votes arrived at the computers, if you plot that as a function of time, turns out that um, the PRI, the votes for the PRI arrived at the computer at, with the same function, functional form, exactly the same as in 2006, which is impossible to believe because this time they had nine million votes uh, more than in 2006. So um, that is, was telling us that uh, they were manipulating the numbers through computers and they were using the same um, algorithm, the same software mm -hmm. that they used in 2006. But um, the, the, the biggest su surprise uh, from my point of view is the fact that they went back to the old tricks of uh, giving money to people for Allowing, allowing them to keep uh, their electoral card and, and vote for them on behalf of them. Recently there was a news report, and I don't remember uh, exactly where it was or what election was being mm -hmm. held, but on national news they were referring to some place that had an election and it had a problem with hacking. And so they actually had to shut it down and go back to the old method of paper ballots mm -hmm. to solve that problem. Are we in danger from hackers in almost every election that comes up here or in Mexico? Oh well, not in Mexico because they they, they haven't started using um, uh, electronic voting yet. But here in the states, that there was a um, um, an, um, a court a case <coughs> in which an engineer was uh, summoned and he testified that he had developed a software to rig the votes. Mm -hmm. It was in um, Ohio mm -hmm. in um, in the two thousand. Um, uh, 2000 election or 2004 election, one of those. So uh, yes, there is uh, there is uh, of course uh, that danger, 
But at the same time, there's open source software that can be used to prevent that. It's just a matter of convincing Diebold and all those companies to install the open source uh, code. So you think it would still be safer with electronic processing and voting over the old paper ballot way? Besides, we have such a massive population. Mm -hmm. How could we do paper ballots in all of these elections? Well, uh, I think that we should always, uh, we should do both. And we should um, keep uh, the papers as a backup check in case that the electronic uh, happens to be very close. And usually the, um, there are uh, statistical methods that can give you an idea of what to expect. Mm -hmm. And if, um, if you don't get in the actual counting, you don't get what you expect, then uh, you should always have uh, a backup, uh, the paper ballots to go, and go back and count them. So you have all of the records from the past, or as far back as they've been kept, and then you can compare what this election is doing and realize there's something wrong with this one. Yes, or for instance, you can do, um, uh, if you do a survey um, ahead, of, ahead of time, and you survey a good chunk of people in a, in a district, um, you're gonna get very good results. Mm -hmm. And anything deviating for more than two, three uh, percent should cut our, our attention. Okay, now I know this is, this is a program w in which there are opinions. You can express these opinions, as I mentioned a while ago. Is you have an opinion about the power of the cartels in influencing some of these elections in recent days in Mexico? Well, I don't have to express my own opinion. I can give you facts. Okay, give me some facts. Uh, right now, as, as we speak in Spain, there is a, a court case um, in which an operator, a Mexican operator, transferred money from unknown sources to a bank in Spain and then back to Mexico for people to buy the voting cards in the mm -hmm. south of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So all of that is happening in Spain, whereas the main effect <laughs> happened in Mexico. And in Mexico, they, and the Federal Institute, the Electoral Institute, said that there had been no abuses in the, in the uh, uh, with respect to the money that was used for, uh, for the election, that uh, they didn't find any irregularities. Imagine, the, the, the thing is happening in Mexico and we have to wait until another country does the, uh, goes to, uh, into checking all of that. Now, what are they checking? Laundry, um, lon uh, money laundry. Laundry money, yeah. And um, the, they are sure that the money came from the cartels. And in, in Spain, they are sure that the money came from the cartels, and of course, they are um, creating this uh, case. Do you think that the lack of education in the general population of Mexico is a big problem here? Because a lot of the people just want to be left alone, just to find a way to feed their families and cover their heads with shelter, and, and they're not really interested in all of the corruption that's going on in Mexico. Well, th there has been an awakening in Mexico in the last uh, 12 years, I believe. Good. And if you see the people protesting on the streets, you can see huge masses that uh, you would um, would be hard pressed to find them anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And you can find uh, one, two million people protesting on the major uh, square in Mexico. And one, two million people, uh, you don't get them in the States or in Canada that easily. Is that getting the attention of people that run elections in Mexico? Is it sending a signal? Well. Uh, uh, what happens is that um, they are learning to ignore things. In the past, they used to get scared. They used to do, uh, put a remedy to, to things. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, they are learning that if you just uh, bombard the population with uh, whatever they want to put on TV. Propaganda. Propaganda, mm -hmm. and they just don't pay attention to that, uh, they can get away with it. Well, you mentioned in a previous show something about Nieto's uh, wife, a celebrity, an entertainer, and the masses of people were attracted to that image. Yeah. And you think that helped him to get elected? Oh, yes. And now it's, uh, it's kind of ruining his, his uh, image. Oh, yes. And Tell us about what the problem is. Well, this is very interesting, but um, at, the same, at the same time, it's extremely sad. Turns out that, uh, you know, the... One of the promises of Peña Nieto was to build uh, uh, one of those uh, high-speed rails between two major cities in mm -hmm. Mexico, mm -hmm. and they wanted to do the contract with the Chinese with a Chinese company, and 
but uh, the company that was in the middle was uh, a specific company from the state of Mexico. And um, the, when Peña Nieto was the governor of the state of Mexico, which, which surrounds the Mexico City. And um, apparently this company gave a house to the wife of uh, Peña Nieto. Okay. And it was a, a, a huge a mansion, um, it was a huge house valued in, I don't know how many millions of dollars. Well, that got the public's attention. Well, it turns <laughs> out that, um, yes, it, it did. But at the same time, they found that the same company had given a, a kind of a similar house to the, um, the secretary of, uh, of economy in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, they began, I mean, a, a team of, of uh, investigative reporters began finding, you know, little giveaways here and there, mm -hmm. or major giveaways he mm -hmm. here and there. And then um, the company for which these guys, these reporters were working, fired them. And in response, the major journalist that was the supervisor of the other reporters resigned. And that caused a, a big uh, problem for the media, media because uh, Cristina Aristegui is uh, just about the most famous reporter in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is the one that uh, was in charge of the whole investigation, and she ended up resigning. And they came up with all sorts of excuses uh, about why they had uh, you know, fired the reporters. But in the end, um, there's no way back. And uh, now all of that appears to be tied with one of the reforms, the telecommunications reforms, mm -hmm. that apparently the president didn't like what these guys were putting on the, on the screen and forced the company or made a deal with the company, the Multivision, to do um, an exchange. You know, get rid of these people and uh, in return we're going to give you uh, a chunk of the band for the digital stations that are about to come <laughs> up on the air. Sweetheart deal. Something like that. Now when you're reading the Mexican news and you're sitting there and you run across these things, do you have kind of an aha moment? Aha, I told you that was what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> or no. aha, I suspected that's what was going on. No, no, it takes forever to tell you the truth because um, it is very hard to get enough facts in a single uh, source. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is, uh, uh, I'm telling you this now after, what is it, uh, three months that uh, they discovered the, the deal of the right, houses. Right. So uh, you have to investigate here and get a little bit from there, from, and it is, this is how you construct the uh, whole picture. Well, that made news in the United States, too. That was in our media that they were yeah. telling the story of what was going on down there. Now, in general, are you optimistic or pessimistic? about good things happening in Mexico as we move along, changes that are positive. Are you positive or are you kind of negative? Well, uh, I have to base my, my judgment on my experience with the electoral fraud. Okay. Uh, with the electoral fraud, we determine by different ways that it um, doesn't matter what the opposition does, they will never reach power because um, they have the, the the main control of all the ingredients that are needed to um, make it to the presidency, for instance. So the elite controls the media, they control the banking system, they control the industrial system. They control, they control the, tr the tribunals, the yeah. electoral tribunals. Okay. And that's the key. Doesn't matter what you prove, doesn't matter what evidence you have of electoral fraud, if the tribunal says uh, that it didn't happen, then it didn't happen. And there's nothing that can there is no higher um, law that can make them change their minds. Well, you just answered that question, and you are pessimistic about this. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, unfortunately. Now, with respect to the reforms, um, I'm not that pessimistic. I think that uh, things are happening, and we don't have enough information yet. Mm -hmm. I have my cheat sheet here. Okay, with, cheat uh, sheet. <laughs> with all, all the different facts. But just to remind you, we have uh, uh, Mexico uh, embarked on, on uh, reforming the Constitution on 11 areas, mm -hmm. general areas. Mm -hmm. uh, one was energy, the other one was uh, telecommunications, education, uh, electoral, et cetera. And um, it has been, for some of those reforms, it has been two years since they began um, operation. And 
but uh, for the rest, they, they are newer, so we don't have uh, enough information yet. But uh, in energy, they basically they, they were having a garage sale with Pemex. And Pemex, you know, is this uh, Mexican company, oil company, that in, in 2004 was the second largest in terms of earnings next to uh, ExxonMobil. So uh, that tells you the health of the, of the Mexican industry at the time. It was doing very well mm -hmm. if you compare it to other companies. But at the same time, um, Peña Nieto wanted to, to uh, attract uh, uh, investments into the area. And basically, they changed the law to allow private uh, companies to do just about anything that they wanted. Mm -hmm. Prospecting, uh, extracting, refining, uh, plastics, anything. And the only, um, the only thing that they had to do, uh, basically, is pay for the oil that they extract and pay uh, the government because the, the Mexican government owns all the water and all the oil, everything in the, uh, under the earth. So um, one of the problems with the reform has been that uh, the price of the oil fell uh, in the last year or so. Worldwide. Yeah, worldwide. Yeah, okay. And we have been enjoying cheap uh, mm -hmm. uh, gasoline prices because of that. And fracking is uh, uh, the new buzzword in, in this field. There is a new way of extracting oil in, in places that you never expected. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there is uh, less interest from these big companies to invest uh, in Mexico, apparently. And they haven't realized the growth in employment and the growth in revenues that uh, they expected and it has been two years now. So for the, from that point of view, I suppose that things will bounce back mm -hmm. at some point and people <coughs> will want to um, invest in Mexico. They ask you to come to Mexico and do one thing to reform the system, what would it be? Would it be with the Electoral f uh, Commission? You would change the Electoral Commission? Uh, I would uh, definitely put um, extra supervision on that. I would change the rules for electing members of the electoral tribunal, and and then I I I I would leave it for uh, to democracy to change things the way they should. Well, very good. I've enjoyed having you here today. Well, thanks, thanks yeah. for having me. A, a second act. There's always room for a second act. <laughs> We're glad you're. And we hope that those that watch today, if they want to, they can go to that YouTube site and they can look for that and watch your first interview. That would be good to put those two together. So again, thank you for coming. I'm Leon Blevins, Perspectives El Paso.